USA. Your most venerable, please. Before I get started with the talk, I wanted to let everyone know that when I was invited to take part in this conference, they said that one of the things that was most important was that we go back to the original teachings of the Buddha. And what I told them was, that's really good. I've been doing that for 15 years. Now, when I say going back to the original teaching of the Buddha, I mean the actual reading of the suttas and understanding the suttas the way the Buddha presented them. So, with that said, I would like to graciously thank the Most Venerable Essenjo of Japan, His Holiness the Dalai Lama of Tibet, and the Venerable Maharaja of Thailand for organizing this beautiful conference. This is a grand and wonderful undertaking to bring us all in the spirit of peace, understanding, and brotherhood. The purpose of this conference is to explore the original teaching of the Buddha to refine it for the 21st century. Buddhism has something great to offer the world at this time. When the original message is practiced and understood, it offers a useful kind of relief. It seems Buddhism is in the decline right now. Some may say it's an ancient pessimistic religion. Young people may think that this is that this is so when they're told all life is suffering, that desire is the cause of suffering, and that desire to get rid of it is just let go of all of your desires. Is this the solution? Is this the way the Buddha actually taught us? In the Samyutta Nikaya, the Buddha said that there was two ways of teaching, the right way and the wrong way. The wrong way is to focus on suffering. The right way is to focus on the cessation of suffering. I think you would agree that when we're presented with all life is suffering, that this is a focus that new people coming to learn about Buddhism, really, it turns them off. It stops them from wanting to know more. It sounds very pessimistic. Perhaps as an alternative approach, we need to tell interested young people that there is suffering in life. Everybody knows this. That there is a cause of suffering, and the Buddha called this cause craving. He taught people how to let go of this craving and experience relief. The cessation of suffering must be emphasized as the key tool that the Buddhists can offer the world. We do this by teaching the Noble Eightfold Path. It's apparent in this modern age of computer technology, all tradition, traditional ways of teaching the Buddhist path are not working very well. For instance, in my country, Young people come to find out about Buddhism and they come to a cultural center where they're not spoken to in English and they see a lot of bowing and reciting of things that they don't understand. Why would they want to come back and find out more? We have to learn how to incorporate the Buddha's teaching into the language of the country that we're staying in. The 
young people in, the, in my country. They are brought up with their traditional ethnic, ethnic ways. And I don't see that as any problem at all until they start going to school. And then they start learning English. And they have a lot of young friends. And these friends want to find out about Buddhism. But the young people are very um, reluctant to bring their friends to a temple where they know that they're going to be, they're not going to be taught anything. They're not going to be shown what Buddhism is. All they're going to be shown is a lot of people bowing and reciting and maybe they'll get something to eat and then they'll go away. We have to start incorporating what we know about Buddhism into everyday language. The answer to this problem is sorting out the actual teachings of the Buddha from the centuries of cultural impact. This does not mean that cultural aspects of one's tradition need to be dismissed. Rather, it means some, uh, understanding the instructions found in the original teaching and bringing them to light the, br the brilliance of the Buddha's message. But it has to be done in the language of the country you are in. You can't do it in your own language if you come from another culture. It doesn't work. This is probably one of the bigger causes of decline. Because in my country, people come, the young people, they, they become westernized, and the family doesn't like that very much, and they try to force the young people to come to the temple and they're not understanding what's being said. They're not understanding why they have to do all of these rituals. So eventually they stop coming all together and they rebel. And then they become Christians because their friends are Christians. Buddhism in my country it has maybe one more decade before all of the temples will just start disappearing from lack of support. The young people are not supporting them at all because they don't understand why, why practice Buddhism. Today, many monks of all traditions have lost their confidence in the teaching there's no way to attain Nibbana in this lifetime, they say. But is that true? When we examine the original text by the Buddha, the key to successful, successful practice can still be found by specifically following the original instructions of the Buddha. If you have to follow them closely, you can't add or subtract anything. Without adding or subtracting anything, we can practice meditation and attain liberation from suffering. When I came to the West, I'd been in Asia for 12 years. I went back to the United States. I noticed very much how everybody that was practicing Buddhism had a sour face. They didn't have a face that was smiling. They didn't have a face that was happy. They didn't have a face of relief. And this really bothered me. I started teaching people that an important aspect of the meditation is smiling. And not just smiling once in a while, but smiling all the time. And how do you smile? You smile with your mind. You smile with your eyes. You smile with your lips. You smile in your heart. Try this. 
one whole day. Anytime you see that you're not smiling, you can't criticize yourself for forgetting. Just start smiling again. When I started teaching people this, I started noticing that their mindfulness became much sharper. They were able to see what their mind was doing more and more. And because of this, their sitting meditation improved immeasurably. So I started looking into this. And I started seeing that one of the enlightenment factors that the Buddha really liked, he put it right in the middle of the seven enlightenment factors as a balancing act, was joy. Now, when I was practicing, I, I did about 20 years of practice with a, a straight Vipassana Burmese method. Anytime I experienced joy, I would go to the teacher and they would say, don't be attached. <laughs> well, gee, I didn't want to be attached. So I stopped that joy from coming up. The only relief I had, I was stopping it because I was afraid of being attached. Joy is a very major part of our practice. And when you have joy in your mind, your mind is light, your mind is alert, and you can see when your mind starts to get heavy. So it improves your mindfulness. So it's a real important factor. And when I would go to Vipassana retreats, of which I did many, many, any time I saw people practicing meditation, they had this look on their face. Because they were trying so hard. So I would go around when I started teaching them the meditation that I'm going to show you in a little bit. And I would start tapping them and say, no, no, lighten up, smile, be happy. Don't try so hard. There has to be balance in the practice. And joy is a balancing factor. This conference is an opportunity to, to return to the original teaching of the Buddha Dhamma which will help people find relief and happiness. This can be done with respect to personal beliefs and accepting that there are multiple paths to enlightenment. We all are on the same journey and each one of us has our own formula for mental development. This is necessary and it's good. There's no problem with the style of meditation you're using. But what I'm going to suggest to you, because of my study in going back to the suttas, is that there is one extra step that when you put it into your practice, it changes the entire uh, direction of your practice. And it's very important. I found these keys that have previously been omitted that show the way to practice meditation is easy to understand. It's not a complicated system. It's immediately effective. After one sitting, you can see the difference in the practice. One sitting and inviting all interested people to come and see. When you start practicing what I'm going to suggest, and I've seen this happen many times with many students, all of a sudden they're excited about their practice and they want to tell other people. A few years ago, His Holiness the Dalai Lama made a statement. He said, there's something missing in meditation. 
he observed how many people were sincerely practicing meditation and they didn't become fully liberated. He saw, how, uh, he saw many long-time devoted meditation practitioners stop meditating and even change their religious lives because they weren't experiencing the cessation of suffering. This is one of the reasons that the Buddha's practice is on decline. We've gotten into the habit of doing what our teacher tells us to do without investigating for ourselves. Without going back to the original teaching of the Buddha, going back to the suttas and investigating what, it was, what was said there. Sadly, many monks believe that the Buddha's teachings don't translate too well into modern life. They've given up searching the original text to find out what has been changed in the Buddha's message. They're content to go along with the way their elders have taught them without questioning or active investigation. Believe what the guru says. Believe what the teacher says. Don't do anything else. Don't ever question me. I'm your teacher. When I give a Dhamma talk to people I'm teaching meditation to, I allow them to stop me from what I'm saying to ask questions. And we have some great Dhamma discussions because of that. We have to let go of the rigidity of doing it this way and you're supposed to respect me because I'm a monk and you can never question me because I'm a monk and I'm a high monk on top of it all. I don't go along with that. I want you to stop and question anything that you don't understand. That's how I teach. And I believe that that's the way the Buddha taught too. He wasn't so rigid, he wasn't so tight, that he wouldn't allow you to ask questions. Since His Holiness the Dalai Lama has mentioned meditation lacking something, I felt like a little kid in the back row, jumping up and down saying, I know the answer! I know the answer! Call on me! Many years ago, as I started to look at the original instructions in the Mindfulness of Breathing Meditation, which is very popular right now, it's become apparent that the true teaching of what the Buddha taught us still does exist. I saw that one whole section of instruction has been left out, mostly because of commentary. Now this one extra step that I'm going to talk about and show you can be added to any other meditation and your meditation will get deeper and your understanding will grow exponentially because of this one extra step. This omitted step correlates to the second noble truth. There is a cause of suffering which is craving. This is a word that's thrown around a lot. Does anybody know what craving is? We're all supposed to know, but does anybody really know? How does craving manifest? How are you supposed to be able to recognize craving when it arises? What's the way to let go of this craving? What's meant when the Buddha said craving brings the renewal of being? What are we talking about here? Craving is an important aspect of the Buddha's teaching, but nobody seems to give you any definitions. How are you supposed to recognize what it is when it arises? 
These are, quest are valid questions that need to be answered clearly so that we can realize the cessation of suffering and fulfill the third noble truth. To answer these questions about craving, we need to return to the Buddha's meditation instruction. Please explore this with me for a moment. And this is a true exploration. If you're practicing in a different way, let go of your old beliefs and just explore. Because I'm going to be reading directly from the sutta what the instructions are. And I'll explain why I'm interpreting them the way that they are. In the Majjhima Nikaya, number 10, section 4 of the Satipatthana Sutta, it says, and how monks does a monk abide contemplating the body as a body? Here a monk gone to the forest, to the root of a tree, to an empty hut, sits down, having folded his legs crosswise, sets his body erect, and establishes mindfulness in front of him. Ever mindful he breathes in, mindful he breathes out. Breathing in long, he understands I breathe in long. Or breathing out long, he understands I breathe out long. Breathing in short, he understands I breathe in short. Or breathing out short, he understands I breathe out short. The exact instructions say that the meditator breathes both in and out, both long and short. There's no mention of nostrils, nostril tip, upper, upper lip, or abdomen, or any other body location. It simply says that you understand when you take a long breath and when you take a short breath. It's, uh, which means you know and recognize specifically and precisely when one breathes in long or short. It does not say to focus only on the breath to the exclusion of anything else that may arise. It does not say to know the middle, beginning, and end of the breath. These are commentarial instructions and cause, can cause one to overfocus on the breath. The instructions simply say he knows you know when your breath is short and when it's long. Next, the true instructions begin in the sutta. It says, he trains thus, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. The words he trains thus are very important. They mean, this is the way you practice. Whereas before it says that you understand. So there's a difference there. You may notice that the Buddha was not talking about the breath body. He was always precise and specific about the object of meditation. He would have mentioned clearly if the breath was the only object of meditation. But you'll see in a moment that that's not the case. The idea of focusing on the breath body is from commentaries. This does not agree with the original text. Here the Buddha said to experience the entire body. In other words, be aware of what is happening in one's body and on both the in-breath and on the out-breath. Next comes the really important part. This is the step that's been omitted by almost everybody practicing meditation these days. This is critical because it has an action verb in it that tells us exactly what to do on the in-breath and on the out-breath. It says, he trains thus, I shall breathe in tranquilizing the bodily formation. He trains thus, 
I shall breathe out tranquilizing the bodily formation. The instructions say to tranquilize the bodily formation each time one breathes in and each time one breathes out. This is clearly understood by using the correct translation of the word Pali word, Pasambaya. This word can be a noun, a verb, an adverb, or an adjective. It all depends on the words used around it. Today, Pasambaya is often translated to mean that when one focuses deeply and becomes absorbed in the breath, their mind then becomes tranquil. Pasambaya is always translated as tranquil. However, omitting the specific tranquilization of the bodily formation allows the absorption meditator to bring the craving back to their meditation object, leading them away from the Buddha's actual instruction. This is the reason that many people today say that one cannot experience true liberation by practicing absorption concentration, and they're right. If the meditator doesn't relax and let go of the craving every time it arises, they will have that same craving perpetually blocking their path to liberation and peace. This is why it said craving brings renewal of being. These words he trains thus tell us the word pasambaya is an action verb, meaning to specifically, consciously, and intentionally relax the bodily formation on the in-breath and on the out-breath. The meditation is done by breathing in, relaxing mind and body, breathing out, relaxing mind and body. Breathe in, relax, breathe out, relax, breathe in, relax, breathe out, relax. When a distraction pulls mind's attention away from the breath and relaxing, softly let the distraction go. Relax the tightness caused by that distraction. Then the meditator directs mind, mind's attention back to the breath and relaxing. So it's a continual process on the in-breath, relax, on the out-breath, relax, on the in-breath, relax, on the out-breath, relax. If you don't add this extra step of relaxing, you are bringing craving back to your object of meditation and you never recognize it as being that. By using this relaxed step, the meditator will go more deeply into the meditation without craving and experience a clearer idea of why they're meditating. And why do we meditate? The relaxed step in the meditation is actually letting go of craving. The meditation is about using the breath as a reminder to relax. So it's not just the breath meditation, it's the breath and relax. In this way, there's no over-focusing or becoming absorbed or over-concentrating just on the breath. And you can say that with any object of meditation. You want to do a mantra, put the relaxed step in with your mantra. And you'll see all kinds of deeper things that you've never realized before. An important point here is to realize the meaning of the word jhana. Jhana has a deeper meaning than what is currently being used. In the suttas, according to the Buddha, the word jhana means a level or stage of understanding. Not concentration. Understanding. Understanding what? Understanding through your insights 
how the process of dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths actually occur. When the meditator practices relaxing mind and body in this way, they will experience extremely clear insights in every jhana. That is why I like to use the term samatha vipassana jhana or aware jhana when describing this kind of practice. It's not an absorption jhana, that's different. Or an unaware jhana. Now why would I call it unaware? Because when you're practicing absorption concentration, your mind is focused on one thing only, to the exclusion of everything else. You're not aware even of having a body when you get deep enough into the absorption concentration. How can you have full awareness if you don't even know you have a body? This is why it's important to go over these instructions because craving always arises and be, can be recognized as being a tension or tightness in both mind and body. Anytime body has tightness in it, mind has tightness in it. Anytime mind has tightness in it, body has tightness in it. They're interconnected. It is this craving, this subtle tightness in one's head that one can learn to see. Physically, there's a thin membrane that goes all the way around the brain. Every time there is a distraction, that membrane contracts a little bit. When you're practicing absorption concentration, quite often you can get headaches. Why are you getting headaches? Because you're not recognizing this tension and tightness. And it starts to build and get stronger. When you notice that there is tension and tightness every time there is a distraction. It doesn't matter whether it's a feeling in your body or a thought. It causes this tightness to arise. When you notice that your mind has been distracted, you let go of that distraction. Now you relax that tightness in your head, in your mind. And you will feel your mind open up and feel relief. Now, you've let go of the craving. And what you will notice right after this is that your mind is exceptionally clear. Your mind is very bright and alert. And you bring that mind back to your object of meditation. So you're actually purifying your mind of what? Of craving. In simple terms, uh, craving is first seen and recognized as a subtle or not so subtle tightness in both one's mind and body. It always manifests this way, always. With practice, it can be seen, understood, and released. Another way a meditator can recognize craving is that craving always manifests as the I like it, I don't like it mind. It's the first part of the grabbing on. Now, in order to see you have a good working eye, there is color and form. The good working eye hits color and form, and eye consciousness arises. The meeting of these three things, the eye, the color and form, and the eye consciousness, when they come together, it's called eye contact. With eye contact as condition, eye feeling arises. Feeling is Pleasant feeling, painful feeling, 
neither painful nor pleasant feeling. With I feeling as condition, I craving arises. When that feeling arises, it hits the eye. There's an I like it, I don't like it that happens right after that. If it's a pleasant sight, I like it. I want to hold on to it. If it's an unpleasant sight, I don't like it. I want it to stop. Right after the craving arises, there is clinging. Clinging is all of your concepts, all of your opinions, all of your stories, all of your ideas, all of your thinking about why you like or dislike that feeling. Now I just explained to you a process or a part of dependent origination. And this is very practical because as you keep relaxing the tension and tightness in your mind and in your body, you become more alert and more aware of more and more subtle cravings when they first start to come up. As you let them go, they start fading away and eventually the hindrances that cause so many problems with so many meditators, they become weaker and weaker until they will fade away. This is how you purify your mind. By letting go of the craving. There's actually two different kinds of jhana being practiced today. The kind that's mostly being practiced by almost everyone. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what sect of Buddhism you're practicing. If you don't have this relaxed step in your practice, you're practicing a form of one-pointed concentration. And you will be able to see it as you relax more and more into your meditation. You'll see this process. You'll understand it. And you'll start going deeper and deeper into your meditation. And experience a lot of different jhanas. But the jhanas come about because of your understanding. Everything that the Buddha taught had to do with understanding. Not mystical, magical, nibbanas, this thing that will come down and sweep me away. It's understanding how this process actually works. This process of mind and body. Now, after the Buddha was in, uh, became enlightened, uh, let me back up a little bit. As His Holiness the Dalai Lama observed, the absorption or one-pointed type of jhana seems to be lacking something in the end results. Absorption concentration takes a long time to develop, and some undesirable side effects can occur. Constant ringing in the ear, dizziness, headaches. But when you add this extra step of relaxing, these things can be let go of very easily. They won't come up again and they won't ever bother you. Now, I've done a lot of one-pointed concentration in my life. I've had massive headaches. I've had ringing in the ears. I've been dizzy for long periods of time. When I finally ran across the actual teaching of the Buddha and started adding this relaxed step, all of that disappeared. I didn't have those problems anymore and they've never arose, arisen again. When you have these kind of things arise, it is a sign that your concentration is too deep. It's too deep. 
and when you add the relaxed step, the concentration starts to get lighter and lighter and all of these negative things that happen in meditation disappear. I know that I've heard people talking about well, you've got to be careful and meditate with a master because you can go crazy if you don't meditate in the right way. And it's true, you can. Unless you're practicing this way with the relaxed step. Now, I've been teaching this for 12 years. I have not seen one person that didn't benefit in the first day when they followed the instructions precisely. And I have not seen one person, even though they've been practicing one-pointed concentration, that when they added this extra step, that they didn't benefit greatly from their understanding of how this process works. After the, uh, the Buddha was enlightened, he made up a new word. There was a lot of words for absorption, there was a lot of words for concentration, but he made up a new word called samadhi. He made this word up to describe this samatha vipassana jhana and the way to practice this. After the Buddha died, the Brahmins came in and they started changing definitions around. And they changed samadhi to mean one-pointed or absorption concentration. But the original intent of the Buddha was to practice samatha, which means serenity or tranquility, and vipassana, which means insight. And in the suttas, when you look up in the suttas, you can look up the word samatha in the index, and then you work up the word vipassana in the index, and you go to the suttas that they're talking about these things, and they're talking about them quite often in the same sentence. You have to practice samatha and vipassana. They're yoked together. It's like you have two bullocks, and one of them is lazy, and the other one works really hard, and you wind up going in a circle because they're not pulling equally. The concentration that is being practiced, even absorption concentration, when you switch over and add this extra step, all of the years that you practice the concentration are not for a waste of time. You've developed your concentration, you've developed your discipline. You need to bring up this other side, which is the insight. And the insights always arise about how dependent origination actually works. How the process works. This is not a maybe. The term concentrated mind means that the mind is stuck and glued to one thing to the exclusion of everything else that may, may try to arise. Mindfulness is weak at that time. By this definition, concentration mind loses full awareness and mindfulness of what is happening in the present moment because it's only seeing a single thing at a time. It's not relaxing the mind and body. They're bringing, you're bringing craving back to your object of meditation and that makes mind tight and hard. The term collected mind, samadhi, gives us the idea of a mind that's unified, composed, calm, still, and very alert. This kind of cravingless mind 
is able to observe whenever mind's attention shifts from one thing to another. This is seen clearly with sharp mindfulness through the practice of Samatha Vipassana Jhana. When one has craving in their mind, there's no true seeing of how the Four Noble Truths, which are very intimately connected with dependent origination, you're not able to see this impersonal process of dependent origination. As we all know, this is the very backbone and purpose of doing the meditation. This is the backbone of the Buddha's teaching. <laughs> Craving limits one's observation of the present moment, so you don't actually see the real freedom from suffering. Why? What's the cause of suffering? Craving. When you don't let go of craving, how can you let go of suffering? Every time you let go of craving, you are experiencing the third noble truth. A little bit. It builds as you start seeing more and more deeply. Mindfulness means remembering to observe the moments of one's attention when the distraction arises. Now, first, there is a thing that I've developed over the years called the six R's, and this is for English. So if you're using a different language, the letters probably won't be the same. The first is recognize that your mind has become distracted. Release the distraction. How do you release the distraction? You let go of your attention on that distraction. Now, you relax the tightness and tension caused by that distraction. Next, you smile, re-smile, because that's how you have the joy arise. You return to your object of meditation and you repeat staying with your object of meditation. That's the six R's. Recognize, release, relax, re-smile. Return, repeat. This isn't to be done mentally, this, 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 this. It's part of a process. Someone, I was telling about this, they said, oh, you mean we have to roll our R's? And that's it. It's recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, repeat. Stay with your object of meditation. If you use this method, you will be absolutely amazed at how clear your mind becomes. That's a promise. I, I haven't had a whole lot of students, maybe somewhere around 2,000 these days. But when they start using that and they start practicing it, their progress in the meditation is phenomenal. Not just regular good. I'm used to people coming and doing retreat and seeing them get into jhana within a few days. I'm used to it. And their progress in the meditation is very fast. In my country, there's uh, people that teach meditation and they say, well, you got to take a three-month retreat. I wouldn't know what to teach you in three months. Thank You'd you already much. understand everything that you needed to understand after two weeks. You're most amenable. We have to stop for the rest of the program. Okay. Thank you very much.